Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk, the very last talk. I'd like to thank you all for surviving and coming. That's uh, real strength, muy fuerte. Um, as the last talk, I think we should also uh, thank the organizers. Um, I was going to parlo in Italiano, but I can't. So <laughs> let's uh, thank the organizers. I think we have Alan, Bruno, I forget who else. Uh, Michelle, <laughs> Michelle, Dick. Is that it? That's it. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to try and give a talk that will be pretty low key, won't be too technical and too difficult since it's the last one. But if that's too much, and you perhaps would want to, you know, I understand the internet works in this room. If you perhaps would just prefer to look at some lovely pictures of cappuccinos, <laughs> let me put up my Instagram account. <laughs> Hopefully I can spell it correctly. Well, actually, I realize I'm not spelling it correctly. That should be an, instead of the OS, it should be an I, but I'm American. So, you know, please admire, you know, I'm just as happy as if you like my, my cappuccino photos during the talk, or if you like the talk, that's great too. Okay, my underscore cappuccinos. <laughs> um, and if you know anyone in Italy who's looking for barista, I'm available. Okay, let's get started. So I want to talk about uh, a theorem about hyperbolic three manifolds, and um, I won't. If I ever state the actual theorem, it will be at the end. I think I want to, because it's somewhat technical and involves some three-manifold topology, um, which I don't think we've talked about in the last two weeks. Um, so I mostly want to concentrate on examples, and I'm going to focus on just a simpler version of what we want to talk about. So let's start with some definitions. So I want n to be a compact three-manifold. And what I'm going to be interested in is hyperbolic structures, complete hyperbolic structures on the interior of n. And I'm going to restrict to those that are convex co-compact. So we want to look at, um, so uh, convex, so I want to study, so CC of n, this is the, this is going to be convex co-compact hyperbolic structures. On n. Um, now, for what I, the theorem that I ultimately would want to, that we ultimately proved is, is holds in more generality, but this is just to, to keep the discussion simpler and more concrete. So let me just say what this is. So what is this? So this is a, a, a this is, so it's a, this is a complete hyperbolic structure on the interior of n that extends to a conformal structure on the boundary. Okay, so if you want to think about this in terms of an atlas, so here's a picture of our three manifold. And here is hyperbolic three space union its boundary, which we can identify with the Riemann sphere. Well, what I, what I can think of this as being defined by is, is some sort of atlas of charts. So I'll draw a little neighborhood of, say, a point in the boundary. So a point in the boundary will be topologically just a half space. And I want a chart which maps this to a little neighborhood um, in H3 union its boundary where the boundary of the three manifold is taken to the boundary of hyperbolic three space. So this, um, now isometries of the hyperbolic plane, they extend to conformal automorphisms of the boundary. So this will give us a conformal structure uh, on, on the boundary of n. And those are the kind of hyperbolic structures I want to study. Now certainly every three manifold doesn't have um, such a convex co-compact structure. But it turns out that if, um, by a theorem of Thurston, if n has any if n has any, uh, the interior of n has any complete hyperbolic structure, then it does have a convex co-compact one. And in fact, Thurston's famous hyperbolization theorem tells you exactly, gives you an exact characterization of when these, when these things exist. 
OK, and what's the other observation is that a conformal structure on a surface, oh, and I'm going to, let's rule out one thing. I want to assume that, so I don't, I don't want any tori in the boundary. So no, no tori boundary of n. Again, this is just to make life simpler. Oh, actually, it's ruled out by the con there won't be any tori in the boundary of, 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 of n because I'm assuming the structure is convex co-convex. That's a consequence of it. So in fact, and nor will there be any sphere. So in fact, what happens is um, if s is in the boundary of n, then the genus of s is going to be greater than or equal to 2. And in fact, a conformal structure on the boundary of n, um, so if M is one of these convex co-compact structures, so in general, M will be a hyperbolic structure and N will be the manifold throughout the talk unless I get confused and switch them, but hopefully I won't. So if, so if we have some component S in the boundary of N, then S of M is a conformal structure. But by the uniformization theorem, this is equivalent to being a hyperbolic structure. Right. Every conformal structure supports a unique hyperbolic structure. And of course, a hyperbolic structure det determines a conformal structure. OK, and, and what we're really going to be interested in is how, if we know something about this hyperbolic structure on the boundary, what can we say about the geometry of the manifold? Um, all right, so let's first start off with a, sort of a classical theorem. Oh, and let's make one other assumption now in the manifold, which will also simplify things. So I want to assume. Throughout the talk, I want to assume that the boundary of n is incompressible. So what this means is that um, if I take, so I have some component of the boundary, then the inclusion of s and n is injective on pi 1. Then we have the following theorem, which is a classical theorem. And let's, the big chunk of it is due to bears. There's lots of other names on convention. And it says that this space of convex co-compact um, hyperbolic structures on N is naturally parameterized by the Teichmuller space of the boundary. OK, so here is one answer to our question. How does the how does the geometry of the boundary determine the manifold? It determines it completely. Right? If, if I give you a hyperbolic structure on the boundary, that's going to give you a unique uh, hyperbolic structure on the interior. All right, but we'd like a more precise answer to this question. Um, and so, yeah, so let, let, let's think of more, uh, more, uh, some more detailed ways we could can, we can try to understand the geometry. So let's let. Gamma, so in the boundary then, be an essential closed curve. OK, so if we have a hyperbolic, so if we have a convex co-compact hyperbolic structure on the interior of n, or if we have a hyperbolic structure on a, on a closed surface, then every essential curve, every curve that's not homotopic to a point, is homotopic to a unique geodesic. So we can measure the length. All right? So we can measure the length of gamma as a geodesic. Um, on so if we have some hyperbolic structure M, we can measure it on the boundary of M, which has a hyperbolic structure as a surface. Or we can push the, 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 the curve into the interior of the manifold, or um, in the three-manifold M, in the hyperbolic three-manifold M. Okay, in both cases, we have some geodesic representative, once on the hyperbolic surface and the other time in the hyperbolic three-manifold. And so I'll denote this. So this is length in the boundary. And then 
Here is length and manifold. So a natural question is, how do these two lengths compare? Okay. So that's a pretty straightforward question, and hopefully we have a straightforward answer. Everyone got that? I'll raise it. So in one direction we do. In one direction we do. There's a, a, a pretty elementary bound due to, due to bears that tells us that if, if um, I know what the length of a curve is on the boundary, then I can get a bound on that length in the manifold. So it's called the bears inequality. And it says that the length in the boundary, 2 times the length in the boundary, is going to be longer than the, the length of the curve in the hyperbolic three manifold. OK, well, what about in the other direction? What about in the other direction? If I know, um, if I have some control over the length here, can I say anything? Uh, can I get any upper bounds in the length here? And the answer is no. And there is um, uh, sort of an, an easy way to see this from this parameterization theorem. OK, so what I'm going to do now is, well, this isn't possible in any three-manifold, but we certainly can construct three-manifolds where we have two curves on the boundary that aren't homotopic as curves on the boundary. Say they may lay in different um, boundary components, but are homotopic in the manifold. So now let's assume that gamma and gamma prime in the boundary of M aren't homotopic in the boundary, but they are homotopic in the manifold. OK, well, we could, there, this is not hard to construct a manifold with such a property. For, so for example, we could choose n to just be a surface across a, a closed interval, right? And then we could take gamma and gamma prime to be the same curve on the surface, but on the two different components of the, of, the, of the boundary. Now, what does this parameterization theorem say? It says we can take any hyperbolic structures we want on the boundary and realize that as a hyperbolic three manifold. So, well, um, so what we could do, I mean, is, you know, let's assume these curves are, say, simple and disjoint. We can realize and find a hyperbolic structure so that this curve is much longer than this one, for example. So we can find some convex co-compact structure such that the length in the boundary of M of gamma is, say, much greater than the length of gamma prime. OK, well, then what do we get? Well, th then we know um, from this, this, this bear's bound here, well, let's, let's put twos here just to make it. Uh, so we can apply this. We know from this bear's bound that this is going to be greater then the length, um, uh, this is going to be greater than the length of gamma prime in the manifold. But in the manifold, the two curves are equal. So what we see 
is that this curve is, the, this curve is much longer on the manifold, much longer in the, on the boundary than it is in the manifold. We're not going to, there's no way we can possibly get a bound in the other direction. So another way of saying this is if I, if I just tell you the length of some curve on the boundary, that there, you're not going to have any um, lower bound on, you, there's no way you're going to produce any general lower bound on the length of the curve um, in the manifold itself. All right, so there's one um, very important special situation where we can, where we can say some very concrete information about how the, how the geometry of the boundary determines the geometry of the manifold, and I've already mentioned this. That's when n is just equal to s across some closed interval. And here, the surface s is a closed surface orientable genus, genus greater than or equal to 2. Um, in this case, dc of n, this is the quasi Fuchsian manifolds that uh, were discussed uh, earlier by uh, Jean Marc and Sarah. Um, and here, I won't, I won't say what this theorem is because it would take uh, at least the whole talk. Um, so there's the model manifold theorem of my three co authors. So this is Brock. Marian Minsky, and what this this man what this um, what this theorem produces it produces a a, a, a combinatorial by Lipschitz model for the geometry of the manifold. Okay, so I'm not going to say what this model is, um, but let me say a little bit about the kind of information it can give you. Um, so the, the way you build this model, you need some instructions, and those instructions come from the curve graph. Okay? And what do you want to input in the curve graph? Well, so I have this quasi fuchsian manifold, so let's, 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 so x and y is the quasi, um, are the, the hyperbolic structures so x and y are hyperbolic structures on S. So they're two points in Teichmuller space. And um, what's the information we want to get out of them? I want to, I want to take a collection of curves. I want the, the, these x and y to determine a collection of curves. And how do they do that? Well, what I basically want to do is I want to take the shortest curves on x and the shortest curves on y. Well, I need to be a little bit careful about that. but. Um, uh, I, I don't think I want to say it too precisely, but I have some curves, which I'll call gamma x. So this is, say, a collection of curves, and another collection of curves called gamma y. These are um, collections of um, bounded, they're not really bounded, but anyhow, uh, uh, simple closed geodesics. on x and y. And from this information, I can, for example, figure out what are the short, what are the bounded length curves in, in, uh, um, in, in x and y. So here's sort of a sample thing you can find. So if alpha lies on a tight, so I'm not going to say what this word is, a tight geodesic in the curve graph, Cs from gamma x to gamma y, 
then um, alpha has bounded length in the three-manifold. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you have this information about the, 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 the geometry of the boundary, and it tells you about the, the geometry of, of the three-manifold. So, so you can get much more precise information than this, but this is just a, sort of a, a sample um, of, the, of the kind of thing you can prove. Okay, so what if you have a manifold that is not, um, that is not a... Uh, that is not just a, a, a surface, uh, an interval, interval bundle over a surface. It's not just S cross I in, in the more general setting. So, okay. Well, one thing we could do is we want to apply this, this, this great model manifold theorem, right, to try and study this more complicated manifold. And the way we can do that is we, we can take a cover associated to the, to the surfaces. So if S is some component of the boundary of N, let N sub S be this corresponding cover. Okay, so we really, oh, here maybe we have some longer piece of chalk here. We're at the end of the conference. It looks like we only have a little, bit, little bitty nubs of chalk left in color. So the rest of the talk will be in color. Box where? Yeah, this box is filled with itty bitty nubs of chalk. <laughs> oh, here's another box. Maybe we'll know this box. Yes, if anyone wants like little three quarter inch nubs of chalk. We're good. Thank you. You found Francois' phone, you found the chalk. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe it would have been better if I had given the rest of the talk in color. All right. So. We have this cover. Now, the cover is going to, what, what is this cover going to look like? What is it going to look like topologically? What is it going to look like geometrically? Well, we can sort of answer both those questions at once. So it turns out that this cover will be a, one of these quasi Fuchsian manifolds. Theorem of Thurston. So if M is some convex co compact structure on N, then this is really a very special case. Okay, so MS is now the, the, the hyperbolic structure induced by taking the cover of M corresponding to this cover here, then MS is quasi Fuchsian. Okay, so this is a special case of um, the, the, what is known as uh, Thurston's covering theorem. In this case, when we're, it's actually a little bit easier to, well, it's easier to prove when, if we assume that our beginning manifold is convex co-compact, this is easier to prove. Um, in any case, we have that this manifold is, is now quasi-Fuchsian. In particular, it's, it's going to be, um, it's gonna be a, a copy, it's once again going to be homeomorphic to um, uh, S cross, cross or closed interval. Okay, well, this is great because we have this theorem, this model manifold theorem, which tells us a lot about the geometry of this manifold. Except, to take advantage of this theorem, we need to know what the two conformal boundary structures are. Okay, um, okay well, we know one of them, right? So when I take this cover, when I take the cover of N associated to the surface S, well, S is some conformal structure on it, and that will be the conformal boundary of one component of N of S. 
right? So if I look at this covering, covering map, um, sort of at the top, it's just going to be an embedding. It's going to be an embedding of some collar of this, this manifold here. But the lower end, we don't know what that is. Okay, and that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. We, if we want to use the information that we have here, then we need to know what that bottom surface looks like. Okay, so, um, so if x is the hyperbolic structure on S in the boundary of M, then X is one component of uh, the boundary of this cover. Okay, so what is the other component? Well, let's give it a name. And so I'm going to, so let's let, ugh, sorry. So if I take this component S, then well, what can I do? I take a hyperbolic structure on M. I take the corresponding uh, cover associated to this, the boundary surface. That gives me a quasi fuchsian manifold by this, this theorem of Thurston. One hyperbolic structure is X. The other I call sigma S of M. So this is the hyperbolic structure on the other boundary component. OK. Well, I wrote this sort of suggestively. This is a map, right? So sigma of S, it's a map from convex um, co-compact hyperbolic structures on N to the Teichmuller space of S. And this is called the skinning map. This is Thurston's skinning map. Okay, so we'd like to understand what, how the behavior of this skinning map. Right. So if we make some further assumptions on our manifold, we get a pretty good answer. So a manifold N is acylindrical if um, every properly embedded annulus a proper homotopy into the boundary. OK, so if you have an annulus that's properly embedded in the manifold, well, you can just homotope that to some annulus on the boundary. So for example, this is very, very much not acylindrical, right? Because you can take a curve on S cross 0, you could take the same curve on S cross 1, and they generate an annulus that you're not going to be able to homotope into the boundary um, through a, pop, through a proper, proper homotopy. A, that is a homotopy that keeps the boundary curves in the boundary. OK, so then we have, well, let's give this its name, what is called the bounded image theorem. So this is generally attributed to Thurston, although there's a um, pretty significant last bit at the end 
that was first written down by Richard Kent. And well, what does this say? It says that the, the, the skidding map, so if n is asymmetrical, then sigma mass bounded image. Really going through the chalk here. All right. Here we have more. OK, so this was a very important theorem. It, it was a key piece of Thurston's proof of his hypervalization theorem. Um, so the reason he was studying this is there was a certain gluing problem. He wanted to glue together two hyperbolic three manifolds to make another one. And this, this bounded image theorem played a, played a key role. OK, so roughly speaking, and I don't know if this is at this point could be made into an actual theorem, but roughly speaking, now what you can think of if you have these acylindrical manifolds is there's some core of them. If, if you, you have any convex co-compact hyperbolic structure in N, what does it look like? Well, basically, there's some core that's going to always be the same or coarsely the same. And then the ends are going to look like quasi-Fuchsian manifolds, um, where for each boundary component, the skinned image is, is coarsely going to be the same, right? So if you, um, uh, so having bounded image, you know, if you're doing, say, geometric group theory, well, you might as well think of this as being a point or something, right? Um, so this gives you some starting point to describe a model for what, what the hyperbolic structure in one of these asylindrical manifolds looks like. OK, so. We'd like to come up with a, a similar theorem, but without this assumption of, asylindric of, of being asylindrical. Oh, let me just mention one conjecture before I move on. So there's a following conjecture um, on Minsky's. So, OK, so this theorem says that the image, the, 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 this image is bounded, all right? So you'd like to be good to prove something stronger, and that is the following. The diameter, this is again in the asymmetrical case, so the conjecture is that the diameter of the image is bounded by a constant only depending on the genus. So I think one of Minsky's motivations for making this conjecture is that, well, we've, we've learned quite a bit about the geometry of hyperbolic three manifolds in the last 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And this is a pretty basic question that we still seem to have quite a tough time um, figuring out. There's various partial results, but I, I think I will not mention them now. Um, OK. So how might we generalize this? How might we generalize this? So to state that the, the actual theorem that, that, that we prove involves some discussion of the characteristic submanifold, and uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I could. I would be too embarrassed to discuss the t characteristic submanifold in front of Dick. So I'm going to avoid that and instead um, just stick to a very concrete example. And then maybe at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the more general theorem. OK, so what I want to do is talk about a very uh, specific manifold, the Book of I bundles. And um, it's, it's going to be very non-acylindrical, but it's also not going to be a surface bundle. So let's talk about the bo Books of I bundles. So let's let um, sigma 1 through sigma n, be compact hyperbolic surfaces with, um, 
one boundary component of length L. Okay, so I just have a bunch of surfaces. They're hyperbolic. Maybe they have, you know, varying genus. Maybe so on. But their boundary components are all the same length. Okay, so okay, so I should let, let me say that that I'm gonna I'm gonna do the, the some geometry and topology at the same time. The book of I bundles that can could be constructed purely topologically, but I want to think of it geometrically as I do the construction. Okay, why why do I want all the boundary components at the same length? Well, I'm gonna glue them together. So glue boundary components. by an isometry, form a two-complex uh, x. Okay, so I'm just going to glue all these things together. Um, to form a two-complex. And let's give this curve a name. The, the curve we're going together, let's call this gamma. That's the curve that, that, where, where all, these, all these things meet. OK, so in fact, you can embed this in R3 if you wanted to. Um, I won't try and draw the picture. It's not that hard to do it, but beyond my personal drawing talent. Um, but I can thicken this. form a compact manifold with boundary n. So I won't really discuss this particular issue in the talk, but there's actually more than one way to do this. This is, a, a, this, this is a, an example of a way of constructing three manifolds um, so I can rearrange the way I, so why is this called the book of I bundles? So these, these services are the pages. And, we're, um, and we're, we're putting them together to make a book. And you could rearrange the pages, and this gives you an example of three manifolds that are homotopy equivalent but not homeomorphic. By putting the pages in different ways, I can make the homo homeomorphism class of this, of this three manifold uh, change. So, this gives lies to all sorts of in interesting phenomena, which I will not discuss today. Okay, well, how can I make this into a hyperbolic structure? So what I want to do is I want to take this uh, two complex and I want to embed it, I want to take its universal cover and I want to equivalently embed it in hyperbolic three space. Okay, so this, 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 um, X, it has, it has some geometric structure to it, right? Because as I was saying, these surfaces that I'm using to build it, they're hyperbolic. They have a hyperbolic structure, so there's some geometry to this. And I want to see that if I make the geometry correctly, I can isometrically and equivariantly embed this, uh, the universal cover into H3. And then, well, when I say equivariantly, I mean there's going to be some group of isometries of H3 that are going to... Um, Act when restricted to the action on the universal cover. This thing will be the deck group. So, I I want to embed universal cover x tilde. I want to embed equivariantly um, x tilde in H three. Um, such that there is a group gamma of isometries of H3 that fixes um, 
X tilde, setwise, not pointwise, and acts as the deck group. Okay, so this universal cover will be sitting in H3. I'll have this group of isometries, and um, I'll have this group of isometries, and then when I restrict the isometries to the, 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 to the X tilde sitting in H3, it will just be the deck group, so the quotient will be this, this two complex again. And if I do this carefully enough, okay, so if I do this carefully enough, I'll get that I'll get a three manifold M H3 mod gamma, which is one of these convex co compact structures on my book of I bundles M. Okay, so there's a lot of things, a lot of care I need to take when doing this. Um, but the key thing that I want to think about, okay, maybe I'll draw it over here. So, what does that universal cover look like? Well, it sort of looks like a tree, except it's got an extra dimension. But so what do I need to do if I want to embed, you know, say, a, a, you know, the regular trivalent tree in H two? It's a similar problem, right? I mean, if I look at this, there's going to be branching in every direction, and I want to try and fit this thing in H three. So what happens when I do the same thing with, with, with a trivalent tree in H2? What do, I, what do I need? What sort of geometric information do I need to know about the tree to be able to do this? Well, the point is I need the edges to be sufficiently long, right? If I want to embed this tree in H2, if the edges are too short, right, if the edges were too short, then, um, then, then the thing could start hitting, it, hitting itself. Okay. But if they're long enough, well, what happens is, you know, any, any sort of path in here looks like a quasi geodesic and they, they don't intersect. So, um, to embed this tree, we need, to embed, we need these edges to be long. They have to have some definite length. Right, if we do it, we can't do this in R2, we can't do this in Euclidean plane, and if the edges are too small, then the picture will look too Euclidean and there'll be some self-intersections. We'll run into trouble. Okay, so you can probably make some estimates using Gauss-Binet um, if you wanted to, but we won't worry about that. Um, so we have the same issue here. Um, but what do I mean by edges? What is the length that I need to control? What is the length that I need to make sure is too short? So a necessary condition Um, for embedding X tilde equivariantly is that um, is that the shortest geodesic uh, Proper geodesic arc arc on the sigma i must be sufficiently long. Okay. You can sort of, the, the, the corresponding thing in the three-dimensional picture, this is like some geodesic arc. This is like the lift to the universal cover of some geodesic arc connecting one boundary component to the other. Okay, well, there's just a sort of a simple area argument you can do with surfaces. If these boundary curves are very long, then there will always be a very short arc. So this leads to the following. Um, the length of L must be bounded. I mean, I'm sorry, the length of gamma. Length gamma must be 
found it. This boundary really doesn't. Okay, well, this isn't maybe the most satisfying proof, but um, this is uh, so. This is a special case of a theorem of, of a theorem of Thurston. Hopefully, this is uh, the motivation of why it's true. Um, so this is very different than in the case of a, of just looking at a surface bundle. Well, what is a surface bundle? A surface bundle is a book of I bundles with only two pages. And in that case, this, the, the length of this, you know, and there's no control over the length of any curve um, if you're looking at an arbitrary uh, hyperbolic structure on a surface bundle. Um, but if you start adding pages, if your book of I bundles is non-trivial, it has three or more pages, then the binding curve, this curve gamma, is going to have uniformly bounded length only depending on the topology. Okay, so now, let me state. Our theorem. Okay, so this is the relative bounded image theorem for this very special manifold. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to control the entire skinning image. There's no way, because um, as, as I was saying at the start of the talk, for curves, you know, so if I, take a, if I take a curve that's lying in one of the pages, I can make its length be anything I want on, on both sides. Okay, and that, that um, you know, yeah. So for example, yeah, anyway, there's, there's no way I'm going to be able to control the length of curves that, that lie on the pages. The, the only thing I'm going to be able to control is the length of this curve gamma. And so, let me state it. So let's let S be a component of delta M. Um, then there exists some L greater than zero such that the length of gamma on the skinning image, so for all, so the length of gamma on the skinning image is less than, um, less than L. And this is, as, I mean, in this, this particular manifold is, is, is very close to being an I-bundle. It's, it's sort of as close as to being an I-bundle as you can be without actually being an I-bundle. And this is the only curve that we have any hope of being able to control. So notice by the Bayer's inequality, this theorem applies, you know, the statement of Thurston. But we very much use the statement of Thurston to, to prove this. So we're not, certainly not giving a new proof of that. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, so again, there's no... So, and, and again, this is the point. The, the, the other, all other curves that lie on the surface, I can make them as long as I want. And there's, so there's no way I'm going to be able to control their skinning image. If I control the, 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 the length of any curve in the boundary, I'm controlling it in the manifold. And since every other curve I can make as long as I want in the manifold, I can make it as long as I want. Okay, so let me just say a bit about why this is true. And then maybe I'll say a bit more about you know, what, what, what you expect in more generality. So the result of Thurston is that the 
so you have this binding curve, the core curve where all the, all the pages are glued together. And Thurston's result is you take any hyperbolic structure in the book of I bundles, there is a universal bound on the length of that core curve. And this was supposed to be sort of why you should think that that's true, at least in this special case. I mean, his argument is different, but I mean, I, I don't know. It's I mean, probably for this special, I mean, he, he proves something much more general. And probably for this particular situation, you could use this kind of argument to prove his statement, but th that, that's not what he does. OK, so let me just say, say a few words about, about why this is true. Um, so what's our picture? So we have this book of I bundles. So I'll draw sort of, so here is our, Here's our original complex X and sitting inside the manifold N, and let's say this is the surface S. And then we lift to the cover, so N sub S. The cover. And on the top, we have, okay, so here, um, ooh, I used X too many times, didn't I? Okay, so over here we have the, the, the original hyperbolic structure that was on the, the, the manifold uh, M, boundary of M, and then down here we have the skinned image. Okay, and well we have this result of Thurston that says if I look, so, okay, so I have the curve gamma which I'll draw as a dot here and I'll draw as a curve in here. I have this result of Thurston that tells us that that curve gamma has bounded length, has uniformly bounded length in the manifold. Unfortunately, we know that having uniformly bounded length in the manifold doesn't tell you anything about the length and the boundary. It doesn't give you any upper bound of the length and the boundary. So what can go wrong? And so the, basically the, there are sort of two things that can go wrong that can make this curve gamma be much longer down here than it is here. One thing is there might be some short curve, there might be some very short curve that lies below this curve. So this is some short curve. Below gamma. And the other thing that can go wrong is there might be, is this really a different color? Let's see. There might be lots of curves. Well, maybe they're not short. Lots of bounded length curves. So these are bad, these are the bad things. We want to rule out. We want to rule these things out. Want to rule out both. Okay, and, and why why are these the two things that are bad? Well, this 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 is as I was saying before, we have this awesome model manifold theorem that tells us a lot about the geometry of three manifolds, and it comes from that. It comes from that. Um, Okay, so how do you control this? Well, this is where the cores come in. So we have this sort of nice X sitting inside here. And what do we know about X? Well, we know all the things that we know about hyperbolic surfaces. Okay. So for example, um, you know, we, we know things like the, 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 the diameter of this surface is bounded away from the thin part. There's various things we know about the geometry of these surfaces. And then the other piece we know is bounded length, which, you know, from this, from this theorem of Thurston. Um, okay, so that's a very, very rough sketch of, of some of the ideas behind the proof. And let me just say a little bit about how you can do this more generally. So 
So in general, n is built out of um, three kinds of pieces. I bundles, paired cylindrical manifolds, Solid tori. Okay, so this is the uh, characteristic submanifold theory that I am avoiding discussing. So there's a unique way of breaking your manifold into these these, these pieces, which I am not being very precise about. Um, but roughly speaking, what can I do? Well, I can take, say, some I bundle, and then I can glue it to some three manifold that's, say, a, some compact three manifold with boundary. Here, maybe I'll draw it slightly differently. So here, over here, I have some, say, a cylindrical three manifold. Oh, I'm drawing those there. So here's the boundary of it. And I can take this boundary of the I bundle, and I can glue it to some curve in the boundary of the a cylindrical three manifold. And then I could do the same thing over here with some other a cylindrical three manifold. And maybe this three manifold has some other boundary component. And you know, maybe I'm doing some I bundle, you know. There's, you can just piece these together, okay? Um, and what's the point? Well, the window is this part. So this is the window. Of the manifold. The I bundles are the window. You can see through them. You can push the curve from one side to the other. And the general version of the relative bounded image theorem says that if a curve is homotopic outside of the window, then you get this bound. Okay, so I'll stop there. <laughs>